Hey everybody, my name is Scott McCormick and today I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a very long time and that is record a Bible study. Um, we stopped doing those a while back because during the Bible study with a lot of people there, if the camera's on, they're shy to ask questions and shy to bring things up and that's totally awesome because I'm shy and so I get that. So we turned it off so that everybody felt comfortable to just be themselves in Bible study but this week, Bible study didn't happen. Uh, Matt is moving and Alyssa had to work, imagine that, um, and other people couldn't make it. So rather than let the week go by without us spending some time in the Word together, I thought I'll just make it a recording. I also know that there's a lot of lurkers in the Bible study channel, which is totally okay. I'm a professional lurker by trade, and so I get that. And I've also had people tell me that when I did record things and post them, that they watched them. So if that's you, then I hope that this is super helpful. Um, today, we're just going to continue where we left off last time in our regular Bible study. We're uh, still in the book of 1 John in chapter 2. We'll pick up where we left off, uh, but before we get started, how about I'll pray, then we'll read the passage, and then I'll turn on the whiteboard and a couple of other uh, housekeeping things. If you see this rotating machine back here. This is my space heater. It's freezing in the basement. Don't let that distract you. It's not a magic PS4 that rotates back and forth. It's just a heater. And then if you see me look over here, this is not Slack or anything like that distracting me. This is OBS, which is what I'm using to do the video. So if you look over here, just pretend I'm not looking over here because I don't have a way to interact with it without looking at it. So anyway, by the way, this is live and uncut. I am not even going to edit this. So uh, let's pray, and then we'll dive into the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I praise you. I love you, and I praise you that you've given um, us the opportunity to know you as deeply as we can by the giving of your Word. This is revelation in its purest form. We can see you and see your glory and the things that are made in this world. But you inspired real men throughout history to write these things, these words that are your words, so that we can know who you are and know of your love for sinners. And so I pray that you, uh, by your spirit, help us to understand these things, that you would help us, uh, that you would open our eyes and our minds to understand the great things of the law in your word. And I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So. Uh, let's dive in. I'm going to start here in 1 John chapter 2. Now, um, you need to go get your Bible. If you don't have your Bible right now, hit the pause button and go get it and come back. If you don't have one of your own, I got two things to say. One, you can either get on Bible.com uh, and read the Bible there, or if you want a physical copy of your own, just private message me in Slack because I've still committed to if anybody wants a Bible, I will drop ship you a Bible. Uh, just like this one. This is my little teaching Bible. It's an English Standard Version. And so if you do ever join us or you follow along in a recording, I'll be on a certain page and you can be on the same page number with me. So if you're in this Bible, you have one like me. We're on page 1021, the, uh, the book of 1 John, chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1 and read to uh, verse 6. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, if we start in chapter 2, there's some things that happened in chapter 1 that we need to talk about first. Uh, and we'll just summarize them real quick. Before we do, let me, let me look over here. I'm going to change the scene to whiteboard mode and get my whiteboard out. So let's see here. We are in 1 John. First John, hopefully this isn't too laggy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Now, we're going to go through several passages of Scripture today, and I'll continue to just write them up in the top right. Let me get my notes out so that I've got all the passages here. There we go. Google Keep. 
Um, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, and that's what we just read. But there's a little bit uh, before that in chapter 1 that I want to skim through real quick, starting in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, it's it's hard for us to get through chapter 1 there and not go, okay, I get it, all right, I'm a sinner, and I need to confess that, I need to own that, I need to recognize that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, I need grace here. I need somebody to forgive me and bring me to God and make me right with him. So you get to the end of chapter 1 and you go, okay, I'm a sinner. And then look at this in verse 1 of chapter 2. John is writing this and says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So that you may not sin. Um. I'm sorry, (laughs) didn't we just in chapter 1 all admit that we do sin? So isn't it like okay that I'm a sinner? And then he turns right around and says, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. Is he saying that we'll all be perfect? That, That we need to actually be perfect to be right with God? No, he's not saying that. Instead, he's saying that we need to strive for something it's called personal holiness. In other words, you yourself are actually working on not sinning. It's not a means of being made right with God by being a better person. In other words, God doesn't love me because I'm trying to be a better person. He loves me, and as a result, I'm striving towards that example that he set. And I want to I want us to see an example of this in another place in scripture. So turn with keep a finger in 1 John and turn back a few pages to 1 Peter. Now in my in my little Bible that was just two pages that I turned. So you may have to turn a little further if you got a, a thicker one. Uh, but we're going to be in 1 Peter. Let me write it up here at the top. 1 Peter chapter 1 and we'll read 13 through 16. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, didn't we just talk about obeying commands? Here's Peter saying, being obedient children. Sorry, I got distracted. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who calls you is holy, You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what is the why? What's the big why for why God wants us to be holy? When we call ourselves Christians, we are identifying ourselves with Christ. It's like saying we're his. We belong to him. We belong to the Holy One of Israel. He is holy. And for his name's sake, he's asking us. He's expecting us. He's calling us to pursue holiness because he is holy. And so when John is writing and he says, my children, my little children, he's very fatherly and pastoral in this passage. He says, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. This is a call to personal holiness. This isn't a well, okay, I've accepted Christ, and now I'm just going to sit in my sin, and that's it. I've got my fire insurance. I'm not going to go to hell anymore, So, uh, but that's it. I'm just going to stop. No, he's calling you to reach. This is, this is now you, in, in, a, in a synergistic manner, working together with the Holy Spirit as he sanctifies you and makes you more holy. Well, I don't know about you, but that's kind of discouraging sometimes to me, because I... When the Holy Spirit reveals sin to me, I get pretty bummed out. And Satan uses that opportunity to try and hold me down and say, 
You're not good enough for this. You can't do things for the kingdom. You can't do stuff for God. Look at all this sin in your life. You got to get that stuff cleaned up first. But look at what John says here, still in verse 1 of chapter 2. Turn with me back to 1 John chapter 2. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This word advocate, let me erase some of these things on the board. This word advocate, oh, wrong pen. This is a legal term. You need to think about this in, in terms of maybe like a lawyer. Um, this is somebody who is like a defense attorney. Ooh, that's even better. I'm going to cross that out. This is someone who stands in the court and advocates on your behalf before the judge. The Greek word that is translated advocate in this verse is only used one other time in, in, in Scripture, and it's used by John, but not in uh, the letter of 1 John. It's used in the Gospel of John. I want us to read it. So turn with me um, to the Gospel of John. In my little Bible here, we're going to be in John chapter um, 14. John chapter 14, it's on page 901. John chapter 14, and we're going to read verses 15 through 17. I forgot to write it up there, so maybe you're still flipping. John 14, 15 through 17. Okay. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's a running theme. Man, that keeps popping up. Verse 16, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Remember that word, helper, to be with you forever. And who is that helper? In verse 17, he says it, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So this word advocate in John 14 is also translated helper, and it is used of the Holy Spirit to describe his relationship to us. He is our helper here as Christ is our advocate before the Father in heaven right now. So when Jesus was on this earth, he was the helper there for the disciples in person, and he said, and I will ask the Father. When I go, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. The Holy Spirit was sent to be your helper here. Jesus is your helper there. Same word. And I, and I want us to see the unity there of the three persons in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, are all involved right here in John uh, 14, 16. So that when we read that part back in 1 John, uh, where it says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, how is, Jesus, how is Jesus defending us before the Father because of our sin? What does that actually look like? Well, he doesn't leave us wanting. He, in verse 3, he explains, uh, not verse 3, verse 2. So turn with me back. We're back in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He continues by saying, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I'm sorry, that is a big word. Do, are you familiar with the word propitiation? Let me erase some things here, because what we're about to dig into are some double word score theology words, and I know that there is going to be a temptation to kind of glaze over. You're going to go, that's a word I've never heard before, or it's a long word, or I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. Um, and don't let your eyes glaze over. Don't just skip this part. When I first started to study some of these concepts, um, this idea of propitiation and some of the other things that we're going to talk about in a second. Propitiation. It's even hard to write. As I got into it, I began to realize these aren't high-level theology concepts. These are like the nuts and bolts of how Christianity actually functions. This is like the bedrock foundation of our understanding of the gospel. You understand these things, and you're going to have a clear picture of what it actually means to be saved. 
So this is going to transform all kinds of things in your mind when you think about your relationship to Christ, when you're of your relationship to the Father, your relationship to the Spirit, uh, when you begin to understand these things. So let's dig in. The word propitiation, that's used elsewhere in the New Testament. And I want us to look there for our first hint at what this means. So turn with me now to the book of Hebrews. And while we're turning, I'm going to ask my usual trick question of who wrote the book of Hebrews. And if you said, I don't know, then you're right. Because we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We know that it is inspired. It is the word of God. But we don't know the name of the actual man who wrote the book of Hebrews. So we usually just say the author of Hebrews. You have to say the whole name. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Here, Paul is, uh, I'm sorry, not Paul, the author of Hebrews, see, I get it wrong. Uh, the author of Hebrews is writing to the Hebrew nation, and he is explaining to them, he is defending Jesus as the Messiah. That's like what the entire book of Hebrews is about. It's proving that Jesus is the one that they were looking for. And so here in chapter 2, he makes a comment in verse 17. He says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers, and he's referring to us, made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, and catch this part, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so here we get a definition for propitiation. Propitiation is a sacrifice that turns away wrath. A sacrifice that turns away wrath. Whose wrath? In this case, we're talking about God's wrath. God is a just God. He is a holy God. And all sin against God, he has to punish because he's just. So he is always angry all the time at sin. Not at sinners, at sin. Now, in some respect, if someone is not in Christ, they're not covered by his blood, and we're going to talk about how all that works in just a second, then yes, he's angry at that person. But he is always angry all the time at sin. And so propitiation is a sacrifice that turns away, in this case, the wrath of God against sin. Now, there are some other words that often get used in conjunction with propitiation. One of those is expiation. And we're going to go, uh-oh, now we're in now we're in uh, now we're in the deep weeds. We could talk about imputation. Uh, we could talk about justification. And we could talk about sanctification. Today, I want us to talk about, um, I'm going to do a big circle like this. I want to talk about all of these, propitiation, expiation, oops, imputation, and justification. These are all big words. And how do we understand big words? I do it by drawing pictures. I'm a professional stick figure drawer, so let's draw some stick figures. And I'm going to go ahead and erase all of this up here so that we have plenty of room to draw. Okay. When we are saved, there are a bunch of things that happen. There's a whole process here. There's a, there's a past component to your salvation. There's a present component. There's a future component. And I want us to draw here. Let's see. Let's start right here. This is, this is me. Okay. My name is Sinner. By the way, hi. My name's Sinner. It's good to meet you. Um, and then over here is the cross. This is a representation of what Jesus did on the cross. He died for sinners. Now, there is a verse. In fact, I wanted to read a verse here before we got into this. So I'm going to hit pause because I didn't write it down in my notes. So let me hit pause and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. I told you this is live and uncut, but it doesn't mean I can't pause and then come back, right? So I cheated. Um, I looked it up. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
So this process that we're about to that I'm about to draw on the whiteboard. I would call Christ's reconciliation. In other words, it's it's Jesus reconciling us to God. How does that process work? And in uh, in the letter to the Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter five, he starts off. Uh, he let's see, we're going to be in verse. Did I say twenty one? Let's start in verse eighteen. Second Corinthians eight. Uh, I have to write it. 2 Corinthians 5.18. We'll start reading there. Okay. Uh, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So reconciliation is not counting our trespasses against us, but instead entrusting to us the message of uh, reconciliation. So how does that work? He says so in verse 21. He says, for our sake, he made him, Jesus, him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So let's see what that looks like. So here is Jesus on the cross on the left, and there is something that is put on him. That's our sins, like this. Our sins are put on Christ. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Now, it says that he knew no sin And so something else happens in this exchange that something is coming over here and being put on us. And that's Christ's righteousness. That him who knew no sin, that's his righteousness. So something from us is being put on Christ on the cross and something happens to us when we are converted that is given to us and that's the righteousness of Christ. And this process of putting something on something else is called imputed. Our sins were imputed to Christ, and his righteousness is imputed to us. So if you ever hear anybody say the word imputation, that is a big fancy double word score word for something being put on to something else. Our sins are put on to Christ, and they were crucified on the cross. The payment was made for those sins on the cross. And then his righteousness, when we are saved, when we're converted, when we turn and trust and put our faith in Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us. Does that mean we become perfect? No, that won't happen until we are glorified, either when we die and go to heaven or if Jesus returns, whichever comes first. That's glorification. That's when you will be made perfect. But his righteousness here is being accounted to us. So, Where do propitiation and expiation show up on this drawing? Well, propitiation is over here on the left. Propitiation, remember, is a sacrifice that turns away wrath. In this case, the wrath of God against sin. Our sins were put on Christ, and God, it says in, um, I think somewhere in Isaiah, um, was pleased to crush him on our behalf. All of the pain and suffering that he went for as punishment for sin was on our behalf. This was what sometimes is also called a substitutionary death because it was a substitute for all who would ever put their faith and trust in him. A substitutionary death. That was the propitiation for our sins. Now, then what is expiation? Expiation looks like this. Over here, we've got... Uh, and I'm going to cross. I'm going to I'm going to cross this out and write Scott because we know Scott is a sinner. So up here, this is the clipboard of Scott's sins, and they're long. I mean, long. Even today, they're long. All the sins I committed today, that list is long. And then next to it is this other list, and it's got Jesus's name at the top. And how many sins are on that list? It's a good Sunday school answer. None. Jesus does not sin. Jesus did not sin. Now, does expiation mean that uh, 
this righteousness came over here and look, here's Scott's board and we're just going to erase it all. And now it's gone. And the answer is no, that's not really what it looks like because my sin is still there. I still committed it. This righteousness being imputed to me and my sins being transferred to Jesus instead means that uh, these sins are all here. And what happened was he crossed out my name and wrote Jesus. And he crossed out his name and wrote Scott. As though the slate of all of my sins was never anything but clean. And if you were in Christ today, that's what your relationship looks like to God. You are accounted sinless because Jesus took on all of your sins. So if you're thinking today, man, I continue to sin and I struggle with this idea that God forgives me. Look at this picture and see that empty board and write your name at the top and know that when God looks at you, that's what it looks like. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't confess our sins. We still need to do that. If we're faithful to confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us. But that is a fatherly forgiveness. It's sort of like when my kids sin against me, when they disobey me in our home, they still need to tell me, Daddy, I'm sorry. And I still need to tell them, Son or daughter, I forgive you. And that's important. That's an important part of your relationship with God. And that's an important part of your the process of your sanctification as you continue in that process of pursuing personal holiness. But take a look at this. On the left is propitiation. On the right, this process of your slate being uh, accounted as clean, that's expiation. Both of these are required for you to be reconciled to God. And so I'm going to write this big word down here, reconciled or reconciliation. When you are saved, you are reconciled to God. And there are two sides of the same coin here. There's propitiation. A sacrifice was made uh, by Jesus to turn away the wrath of God so that God is reconciled to us. And the sins on our conscience are wiped clean, and we are accounted righteous, and that's expiation, and so we are reconciled to him. Both of those things have to happen for us to no longer be enemies. And I hope this picture is helpful to you. Pause this if you want to. Take a screenshot, write it down in your notes, draw the picture for yourself, and write your name in these spots. This is critical for you to understand what it actually looks like when you are saved. Now, does that mean you have to understand all this in order to be saved? No. The, the calling of the Bible is very simple. Look to Jesus and be saved. Turn to Christ and you will be saved. you got plenty of time after that to understand all these details and to grow in holiness as you do. So this was a long aside for us to understand this one word, propitiation. But I want us to turn back because we've got a hard thing to talk about and I don't want to skip it. Okay, so turn with me back to 1 John. I'm going to erase what's on the board. Hopefully you've captured it by now. We're going to turn back to 1 John and finish the sentence. 1 John chapter 2. And we're, we're only in verse 2. It says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I'm going to write this up here. Because this is the hard part. If we were to read this and only this verse, it might make you go, oh, Jesus was the propitiation for the sins of every man, woman, and child on this planet that ever lived and ever will live. And if we do that, we will fall into something that's called universalism. This is the idea that it doesn't matter what you believe, uh, it doesn't even matter if you really believe it hard or not, uh, if, if you really strongly believe it. It, it. it just matters that you exist, and then God will accept you into heaven. And here's the problem with that. It doesn't match up with everything else that's in here. Because there's a ton in this book about a place called hell, a very real place called hell. And uh, I don't know what you've been watching in movies and on TV, but Satan is not in charge in hell. When you go to hell, you don't make contracts with Satan. He's not a guy with horns and a pitchfork and a tail. 
He is an enemy of God, and for eternity, he himself will be punished in hell. Well, if he's the one being punished, then who's really in charge? It's God. Hell is a real place where God punishes sin. And there are people who end up there. Not everyone is saved. The Bible is very clear that there's only one way to God, and that's through Christ. And Jesus himself said that. He said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So what do we do with this phrase when it says whole world? And this isn't the only place where this is difficult. Turn with me to the book of Titus. Uh, Titus is one of Paul's letters. He wrote it to a man named Titus. And in chapter 2, listen to what he writes. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And then, and then he's Paul, so he writes like another five or six verses that are all one sentence, one big long run on sentence. But right here he says salvation for all people. And it, it can make us go, well, wait a minute, does that mean all people are saved? And the answer is no. Now that's hard. That's hard for me. When I began to think about these things, I thought that's hard. And what we don't want to do is go, that's hard for me to get. And just shy away from it. If God wrote it in the Bible, then it's for us to know and understand something that's important. And so what does it mean here? And so I want us to turn now to the book of Revelation to get a picture of what we're talking about when we say whole world or all people. And I really think this is in Revelation chapter 5. Please. Tell you what, I'm going to pause it, and then I'm going to look it up and make sure, okay? I'm going to pause it again. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back, and I cheated, and I looked it up again. So it's not Revelation chapter 5. It's Revelation chapter 7. So here, which, by the way, we've been in 1 John. We've been in the Gospel of John, and now we're in the book of Revelation. All three of these were penned by the same man named John. So in Revelation chapter 7 here... John is talking about he sees the people of God in heaven and what they look like. And starting in verse 9, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. He's talking about the people of God who have been reconciled to God by Christ with all that stuff that we just talked about. And how does he describe them? He describes them, he could have said the whole world, he could have said all people, but this time he was very specific, and he said, from every nation, let me get them all right, from all tribes, from every tribe and people and language. It's not every single man, woman, and child without exception, with no exclusion. Here he's saying from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue or language that God chooses to save sinners from all over, not from a particular place, not people who look a certain way, not people who belong to a certain group, not people who speak a certain language. He saves people from all over without distinction. And so when we see these phrases, and this is why I didn't want to shy away from it, because it took us, didn't even take us that long. We, we could see that if we were to fall into universalism, that's error based on everything else we read in Scripture. And if we go and look in Revelation, we see what he's talking about. He's talking about uh, the whole world, in other words, from all over the world, or all people, in other words, all kinds of people. So in 1 John, he says that he, may, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, because remember, he's writing to specific churches when he writes this letter. So not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, this is comforting to me because that means that I'm included in that. That without distinction, this isn't just for Jews 
This isn't just for Greeks who lived in the same time period as John or lived in that same locality and spoke the same language as him, but this was for me. And if you turn and trust in Christ, this is for you. And so uh, that's as far as we're going to get today. I, the, the, the rest of this, verses 3 through 6, about keeping his commands, this is like a because of all this stuff in verses 1 and 2 then we need to keep his commands. We need to understand that that's a part of loving him because of all these things that he did for us. So, um, I'd I'd like to close this in prayer, and then I'll stop the recording. But uh, I've enjoyed this. I hope you get something out of this. If you do, feel free to tell me, just because that'll bless me too. So, uh, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for helping us to understand hard things in Scripture. Sometimes the words are big, and sometimes the concepts are offensive to our flesh. And so I pray that you conform us to your image so that we can understand these things and praise you for them. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.